uh, thanks for coming along to this uh, this kind of this chat, this session. It's kind of an informal chat, just to give you um, a bit of an insight into the things that I would think about whenever I'm kind of planning for a day out in the hills. And this this is what this session is going to be about. It's primarily kind of some of the considerations and things you'd need to have um, for, for planning when you're when you're wanting to go out into the hills. And I've tried to make it as interactive as possible. So um, there are a few opportunities to, to answer some questions along the way throughout, throughout the talk. So um, with that in mind, we'll, we'll make a start. So first of all, I'd just like to say that um, Cotswold is kind of supporting these talks and they have very kindly um, offered some great quality prizes that we're going to give away to um, to some lucky winners who are uh, to here tonight or on to the next talk next week. So um, there's some great prizes up for grabs, people's names we put into hats and stuff, but then there's a really good quality grand prize of a really good quality low alpine rucksack worth about £130. So there's a question at the end uh, of the talk, which you'll get the chance to, to uh, answer. And then, you know, we'll put those names at the hats and then get the answers and put a name. And then some lucky person will get a fantastic prize. So some of the other prizes are uh, a silver Type 4 compass, uh, a really good quality black diamond head torch, and a, I think it's a, a good quality first aid kit as well. So some really good quality prizes there. So um, yeah, we could be in with a chance to win. So thank you to Cotswolds for, for supporting us for these two talks. So first question I'm gonna ask folk, um, <clears throat> where are you? Where are you tonight? You know, where are you watching this this evening? Um, so uh, Helen, who's my colleague is working meticulously in the background is just going to put up that question for you so you can just click roughly where you are what what country you're in so you're going to go ahead and oh dear is there something wrong with sorry folks i think there's a problem with the <laughs> the polling question just give us a minute oh there we go Oh, I was hoping that there'd be a few people from at least Ireland or Northern Ireland watching, but I think majority of them are from Scotland. So, and a few from down south. So, hello, our Welsh visitors and England um, friends as well. So, great. Thank you for answering that. So, just going to show, like, you know, hopefully tonight the information will be relevant to whoever you are and wherever, wherever you are. So, next question is. What do you do? What what is your kind of main activity that you would like to partake in, or what's the most thing? What's the thing you do the most of when you're out in the hills? So there's a whole choice there that I've thought of. Um, so you can pick and choose uh, a couple of a couple of ones. So to work away there. Oh, so majority are, are hill walking, that's good. A little bit of mountain biking, rock climbing. I was hoping there'd be at least one or two paragliders, but maybe nobody's that ambitious. And wild swimming, oh good. So a few, few brave folk venturing out into the cold. Definitely not for me. Great, no, again, thank you for, uh, for indulging my curiosity there. So, um, just kind of basically kind of highlighting that point of no matter where you are in the country, no matter what your activities are doing, um, this information should hopefully be relevant to us all, but it's kind of mainly going to be focused more around the hill walking and being out in, in the mountains. Um, but again, still relevant information that you can apply. So um, whether you like to go out into big rugged mountains like the Coolin Ridge here, you know, this is Skrelster in the foreground or the background there. So whether you're into quite technical terrain, you know, in the mountains, or you're in more isolated, very remote rolling hills that really kind of feel like you're the back end of nowhere, 
on beautiful days like this, you know, all this information that, you know, should be really kind of relevant and can, can transfer across to lots of different places. You know, it's, it's amazing when you get beautiful days like this and you feel very isolated and by yourself. Other days, it can feel like, you know, just overbearing crowd waiting to queue to get a photograph taken on the summit of Ben Nevis on a hot summer day, just like this photograph shows here a few years ago when I was up. Other days, when you're out in the hills, it can seem miserable, wet, and you question why you're there in the first place. Um, so this picture will be relevant to kind of the next part of the talk next week as well. So you might want to stay tuned for, for more information on that. But this is me and my wife when we were out for a, for a big day out, um, overestimating our abilities, went out in the hills one day. So um, I'll use that more as a reference for, for next week. On other days, um, you know, the weather can be really nice. It can be really wet and windy. And the visibility can get the better of you as well. It can be really kind of confusing as to where you might be. And you might feel a little bit misplaced or disorientated, a bit panicky as well, just because the mist kind of really closes in and you can lose sight and kind of get your bearings a little bit wrong. So just out of curiosity, in this picture here, um, how many people do you think you can actually see? So there's a question coming up shortly. You're going to have a guess as to how many people you can actually see in this photo. So answers are coming up shortly. So if you'd said three, well done. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, three people in the photograph. So if you look closely, you can see the person very obvious in the foreground there. And then maybe just up and to the left of them, you can see another person there with their bag off and a helmet on. And then just above where the person's walking pole is in their rucksack in the foreground, just up and to the right, there is just another person there. So the distance between me taking that photograph and those three people is maybe only 30 meters. And the, the visibility is very poor. And it's really hard to distinguish, you know, a person 30 meters away. So it kind of can show you how, you know, your environment can change from one moment to the next and one day to the next. So it's never the same. So you always have to be prepared for those conditions and you have to sort of put a lot of time and effort into the planning to feel ready and comfortable and safe in that environment that you're going out into. And that's what this, tonight, this session will be looking at, just give you, giving you that awareness and that readiness and a bit of understanding. So I'm just going to ask another question as well. Like, you know, where, where are you in your mountain journey? Where's your experiences lie? You know, um, I'm just using this kind of little bit of a mountain as an analogy to, you know, if you're new to it all, you're kind of starting at the bottom, you're looking up at the mountains and you want to travel up and you're like, well, I just don't really know where to go or what to do to, you know, have been in the hills roughly sort of three to five years, you know, you get up into the hills, you're quite comfortable, but maybe every now and then, you have to turn around because bad weather or you know maybe your fitness has gone downhill a little bit you know that idea or you've been in the hills for so long you're actually turning into a mountain itself you know so uh, just a question is going to come up and just kind of where are you in that sort of journey of your, of your um, mountain experience <clears throat> oh so there's a good there's a good range there of, of, of answers you know from a few folk to who are new to it all to people who are uh, well and truly ingrained into the mountainside so you know hopefully 
there's something to learn for everyone in this talk. Maybe it might be a new way of thinking to those people who are more experienced or a twist on something that they maybe never thought of or to lots of new information for someone who wants to venture out for the first time into the mountains and feel more confident and more inspired to, to go out there and, and actually sort of get up into those hills and start ticking off their Munros and their, their, their Corbett's. So um, if a few folk have maybe been to some of my talks in the past, they may have seen this before and um, are familiar with <clears throat> some of the things I would mention about the idea of going off on a holiday that, you know, if you think about a holiday that you've had in the past or a holiday that you have looked and looking forward to going on, just have a wee moment and think about the time, the effort that you put into organising that trip, uh, whether it's abroad or just within the UK, you know, you spend that time and effort researching, going online, looking for the cheapest deal for accommodation, looking for the best accommodation, somewhere that's convenient. You look at the flights to get to somewhere, the currency that the country may have, how much you need, what the, what the language is, how do I learn some of that language? You know, you go and you put all that time and effort into trying to get as much information as you can to better prepare yourself for that holiday. So then you can have the best experience possible and really enjoy it and feel totally immersed in that culture uh, and come away with great experiences and memories that are going to make you better for the next holiday that you have. So I kind of think, well, if I'm putting all that time and effort into my holiday and putting all that time into making really good plans, then I can take all that ability and understanding and take it into being a detective to then planning a day in the mountains. So whoever your favorite detective may have been growing up or whoever it is now, uh, I was always quite partial to uh, Miss Marple. So it was, I always thought she was quite good when I was younger. Um, but anyway, they all have that ability to investigate, to spend that time looking at all the information that they're giving to then come up with the best possible um, outcome or best possible answer. So for us, Planning a day in the mountains is like being a detective. So in order for us to be that detective, we need a little bit of structure and something that's going to help us kind of follow through a bit of a logical process to think. Uh, and I'm going to take you back to um, kind of the winter time. So this, uh, if you're familiar with this or if you're not, um, this is a um, set of guidelines that was put out for people who walk in the winter, uh, it's called Be Avalanche Aware, and it goes through a process of thinking, basically. And it goes through three stages, the first stage being your, the plan that you do, and then the actual journey that you partake in, and then key places referring to anywhere that you need to make a decision or have a chat with friends if you're out in a group about how you're feeling and what's happening around you. <clears throat> and then within each of these stages, you think about three things. You think about the little snowflake is kind of the snow. The little people is you, the party that you're with, and the experiences that you have, and the skills that you have. And then the mountain is the landscape that you're wanting to visit, whether it's kind of quite technical, rugged terrain or big rolling hills, what's happening in that environment. If we think about this as the avalanche aware process, if we just remove that notion of avalanche, which you won't get in the summer, but maybe change it to be adventure aware, take the snowflake away and just replace it with the weather generally, we can still apply this same step-by-step -step process to our summer thinking and planning to how we then have a day in the mountains. So we're going to first look at just this planning stage. So like I said, you know, you've got the weather and mountain conditions, you and the party that you're with and the skills that you have, and then the landscape you're visiting. So we're going to look around, let's kind of look at this part for the, this talk this evening. So <clears throat> I always say to folk, regardless of the plans that you have, if you want to go over east coast, west coast, if you want to go down south to the Lake District, if you want to go climb on the area around Wales and Snowdon or South Wales, wherever it is, you know, the plan that you should always have is come home safe. That's your plan A, you know, because that will determine whether or not it's a good idea to carry on if the weather's bad or you think you can manage yourself in bad weather or you can't. 
based on your skills and experience. Van A is always come home safe. So uh, I'm just going to focus more on kind of um, hill walking in Scotland here. So I'm going to use this website. I'm sure plenty of you are familiar with it. If you're not, Walk Highlands is a fantastic online resource to look at basically any walk and every walk that, that you could think of doing within Scotland, whether it's Corbett's, Munro's, Graham's, Donald's, low level walks, forestry walks, um, multi-day walks, things like that. It has everything on here. And it's a great resource to use um, the comfort of your home with a cup of tea in your hand and just kind of rifling through where and what it is that you might want to go do. So it's a good starting point thinking about what you can then uh, achieve or where you want to go. So I've picked here just for example uh, Ben Lars and Ben Glass uh, just as a as an example. One, and it's worth noting here that on the right hand side it gives you loads of information here of the distance the walk is out and back or a round trip and the average range that you might do the walk in so it really kind of helps you think well how long is it going to take me where's my level of experience and fitness am I within that bracket or maybe am I new to this do I need to add on a bit more extra time you know, so it helps you think about, well, what time do I maybe need to start my day if it gets dark at a certain time and work my way back from this overall range of time that it's suggesting. So it just gets you to think about a little bit more about, you know, where you need to start in, in your planning. And the other good thing is that it'll give you um, an overview on a very basic map of what the journey looks like and where the paths may be to take you up and down. Uh, that Monroe or that walk that you want to do. <clears throat> and just kind of whilst we're moving on to that subject, the maps, you know, not, not all maps are created equal. Um, some maps are better than others for particular parts of Scotland. Um, some show information in a slightly different way. But the common thing that they all have is these brown squiggly lines that roam around the mountain. Um, so the question is, that's coming up shortly, is what do you think or what do you know these contours to be? Ah, so yeah, well done if you had said areas of equal height. <clears throat> if you don't know, then hopefully you know now that contour lines will show areas of equal height and the steepness of the terrain and what the land looks like. So for you to be able to get an understanding of what the terrain and the environment looks like, you know, being able to interpret a map from a flat image into this 3D reality uh, it's a good place to start thinking about how to interpret the land around you. You know, so contours are the kind of the key to navigation in a lot of aspects, whether that's on an actual hard paper map or if you use, you know, digital mapping on a phone or GPS, you know, <clears throat> regardless of what it is that you use, you still have to be able to interpret what that picture, phone or map will tell you. Uh, and different maps, like the Harvey's maps, people are kind of like kind of like Marmite. You know, when it comes to Harvey's maps, I, either you like it or you don't. Um, or people are very kind of like OS maps all the way, love them. Um, but depending on where you go, sometimes Harvey's might have a little bit of an edge because the information that they present can be easier to interpret. And it's just down to you to have a go and practice with what you like the look of the most as well. So. It's worth playing around with and being open-minded about the different maps that you might use as well. But you can see the one on the left, the Walking Highlands, Walk Highlands one there, gives you that um, basic contour interpretation and the blue line is indicating the journey and the walk you would do from the car park. Um, so when I'm at, whenever I'm planning at home, this is what I would do. I'd have a map open 
I'd have walk highlands open and I would start to look, you know, where the detail is more on a different map rather than just the basic overlay map that they show there. And further on to that, being that detective, we can actually get more information from the descriptions rather than just a picture will tell you, you know, this is where the journey is. But the, the descriptions, excuse me, the descriptions will actually tell you where the journey starts, what to expect along the journey. If there's a significant change in where the, the route goes, you know, at a particular cairn or if there's a fork or split. So being able to actually read the writing and interpret that a little bit more just helps with creating a better understanding rather than just looking at a picture and going, yep, that's fine, I know where that is. Where, you know, a picture on a nice sunny day, which these pictures show, you get there and it could be, you know, thick mist and you can't see anything. But having a description and understanding of what's happening under your feet will help you navigate much better rather than just a picture. So moving on, once we've got an understanding of kind of the mountain that we want to go to and the route that we've got up that mountain, we need to then think about, well, what's the weather going to be like? You know, I'm not just going to go up in shorts and t-shirt and hope for the best. We need to think about where do we go to get that weather? So there are an abundance of different weather forecasts out there that we can all use. <clears throat> Some like BBC Weather give a good general overview of what the weather will be like on a large scale. Um, and then we can get right down to very mountain specific forecasts. The two that I would use most commonly would be the Mountain Weather Information Service and the Met Office. And I would use these in relation to each other. Mountain Weather Information Service will give me a broad overview of a mountain area, roughly above 900 meters, which is where you're starting to get into the heights of Corbett's and Munro's and things rather than down at sea level. And if I wanted maybe more of a specific mountain like Ben Law's Met Office would give you that, you could type in and find a particular mountain and it'll give you the, the forecast for that mountain area. And putting them both together will help paint a better picture of what's happening. Or you can look to see if there's any discrepancies and differences between them. Um, and then you can start to kind of formulate a better picture of, of what you're kind of potentially going to going into weather-wise. So just looking at what key bits of information do you want to gather from the weather? So within the Mountain Weather Information Service, you're kind of looking for five key bits of information. And that could be, you know, how windy is it? What's the wind direction coming from? How wet is it going to be? Are there going to be many clouds in the hill? You know, how low is that cloud? Can I see? Is navigation going to be challenging or easy because the fact clouds covering the hills and how cold is it going to be how many spare layers do i need to have do you have hat and gloves do you have sun cream because it's going to be really beautifully sunny all day you know so it's kind of getting all that information out of the forecast and the good thing about the mountain weather information forecast is it puts a little bit of human touch onto it so it kind of gives you a feeling of what wind speeds can be like for example there it shows you at the top of the page how windy 10 to 20 miles an hour, and then it gives you, well, how is that going to feel on you? And they're saying it's fairly small, so it's not overly challenging. If you like more facts and figures, Met Office can give you little arrows with the direction and the actual speed itself, but bearing in mind that the speed down at the Glen level or where you park your car at the start of the day <clears throat> can be very different to when you start to get up to the height of the Munro. So it's bearing that in mind that, you know, that weather will change dramatically with height and time throughout the day. But sometimes when you look at a number, you know, how windy is windy? You don't really know just by looking at a number. So I'm just going to play a little video and there's going to be a question to follow after. So many of you will know that um, that's Heather with her thumbs up, having a great old time. Um, so the question is, in that video, what do you think the wind speed is?
Yeah, so if you'd said somewhere around the 40 to 50 miles an hour mark, you'd be right. It's somewhere in that range. So it is. Um, <clears throat> and like, I would say to folks, sometimes a way to kind of think about wind speed is that for every 10 miles an hour wind that you see in a forecast would be the equivalent of having a double shot of a really good, strong whiskey. So if you were to think, well, that's 50 miles an hour, so that's you know, five shots, five double shots of whiskey, right? Now, if you drink all those in a row and then stick a rucksack on and stick heavy boots on and then go out for a walk on a hill, you know, you'd be stumbling all over the place and you wouldn't be able to stand up properly at all. So, you know, that's kind of what that range of 40 to 50 miles an hour would speak. Be like, you know, it's, you know, you try to walk in a straight line, but your feet end up off in the place where you had intended to put them. You know, when you're you're stumbling, you're fumbling, you're fighting to to stay upright. Seventy to eighty miles an hour winds, you're basically crouching down almost on all fours, trying to survive. You know, um, <clears throat> so that's really hard work. So it is. Um, so whenever you look at a forecast and you can see what's my risk tolerance, what am I happy to be out in? Am I happy to be out in a fifty mile an hour wind? Then maybe. But what's the terrain I'm going to be out in? Is it technical terrain, like a ridge? Well, 50 miles an hour on a ridge line, maybe not. But are the big, broad, rolling hills where it's low risk? Well, maybe my tolerance for 50 miles an hour wind is, is okay within that. But it's a personal choice. But again, that comes back to where's your experience lie? And what do you think you can see within the plans and the weather that you have presented to you? Before you go out in the mountains. So there's all these questions in the planning stage you need to think about before you commit yourself to going out in weather that's actually you know bad and you should have made the decision of not going out in the first place. But you know, it comes with experience to, to kind of get a feel for that. So kind of moving on to this next stage, now we've kind of got a rough overview of where we want to go, what the weather is going to be like. We need to think about us then, you know, what's, what's the skills that we have? What are we carrying with us? You know, what's in our bags to look after us and, and kind of get us ready for being out in that environment? So <clears throat> Shrek was always quite wise with his words and he was saying that, you know, he has many layers and, you know, we as mountaineers, we're the same. We have many layers and we can wear many layers. So that's kind of where we're looking at here. So this is my uh, work colleague. Robert very dashingly displaying his his thermal underwear. Now you don't have to go to the extreme and wear full leggings unless it's very cold, but having a good base layer to start with, just to help keep that body temperature comfortable, is always a good place to start. And you see he's got nice good comfortable thick socks on as well. Moving on from that, you know, what would we put over the top of that? We may put on various soft shell jackets to keep a little bit of wind off, some slightly heavier trousers. Um, or some other type of you know, uh, lightweight windproof jacket as well. It's really kind of, again, personal choice, but having lots of layers is much easier to help you regulate your body temperature than one big bulky layer that if you take it off, you get too cold, you put it on, you get too warm, and you just can't win. So lots of layers to help regulate that temperature. And then what do we do once the weather gets a little bit the windier, colder, and wetter side? then we might think about having outer waterproofs. Now this could range from top quality Gore-Tex to the Paramo that lots of folk use as well. So again, personal choice, but having full head to toe waterproof body cover could be very useful. <clears throat> again, if you know that it's gonna be a, a bit of a wet day, just to keep you dry, just add more layers to the warmth that you have if you're feeling quite cool. And just while we're on that kind of subject of layers, just something to think about, you know, if, if you're still in that kind of uh, school of wearing cotton, um, hopefully I can change your mind and tell you that cotton, you know, is not a great choice of clothes to wear when you're out in the hills because it just soaks up and absorbs all your sweat. It doesn't dry quickly, you stay cold. And then if it gets cold, it's just kind of potentially going down that rabbit hole of, of hypothermia, you know, so, Cotton's definitely not a great choice of um, 
clothing to wear up in the mountains when it's getting a bit hot, sweaty or cold. Synthetic fabrics can range from merino wool to kind of these blends of polyester and polyamide, lightweight, they're quick drying, a little bit more technical and functional, close fitting. Um, and there's a whole range of ones that you can choose to have. And they're definitely the better one to have for, for layering up and being out in the hills. So yeah, cotton's definitely not the, the friendly choice for being out in the hills with. <clears throat> so thinking about, you know, where you want to go, the hills that you want to do, the weather that you're faced with, you know, how do you pack your bag? What do you carry? And, you know, we could go from a range of different sizes of bags here, depending on the weather that you're going to have and the season that you might be out in. You might be full summer to maybe kind of like the end of summer or spring, autumn and getting into winter. You might change what you carry because that season is going to dictate that you carry slightly, you know, more robust stuff that's going to keep you warmer. So you can see here in this picture, I've got a range that I would call kind of lightweight, very basic. If you know it's going to be a pretty nice day, there might be a few showers passing through. So lighter weight waterproofs might be the more suitable choice just to keep off a little bit of rain and add that warmth. You don't need to carry a ridiculous amount of stuff because it's generally a nice day, but there's still like, you know, map and compass, there's still a, a warm layer, you know, and there's still an emergency bivy bag in there as well and some hat and gloves. <clears throat> but again, that's personal choice. If you want to go on that lighter weight side, you could come to sort of mid weight where it's still lightweight enough to carry, but still kind of going to be heavy enough to kind of keep off the worst of the weather. And might be a little bit on the chillier side or you think maybe there's going to be more prolonged spells of rain and bad weather. And then I don't want to call this next bit heavyweight because I don't like kind of referring to things as heavyweight but more robust. It's stuff that you know is going to withstand torrential rain, it's going to keep you dry all day and you could be in areas where it's just really boggy and wet so having more appropriate footwear like kind of more chunkier boots that are high ankle support and maybe even gaiters as well so you know you can you can have a range of things that you can choose to carry depending on what the weather is dictating that day and I'm not saying go out and buy a fortune of stuff to have but you know it's something to think about because I think um you can carry too much so you can so just think carefully about you know what you carry and again just looking at that sort of footwear you know, a lot of the time when I'm out in the hills, I might wear trainers on a dry day, especially in the Cairngorms, um, <clears throat> where once you're up, it's it's kind of a high plateau, it's fairly dry. Um, and this, you know, trainers are absolutely fine. Where if more west coast or northwest, where it's a little bit boggier and wetter, I might wear heavier boots to just give my feet dry and give a bit more support. You know, so it really depends, you know, where you where you are, what you're doing. And what the weather is sort of dictating for you. And this is all sort of looking at what you want to choose based on the plans that you have prepared and made when you're at home. Sometimes you get unlucky and you do find yourself in a bog on a dry day. So yeah, just take what's appropriate for where you're going. And like I said earlier, um, you can easily carry too much. You know, if you're if you've got a big 50, 60 litre rucksack. You're almost forced to fill it where you know if you have a day bag a day bag of maybe like 20 to 30 liters you have to think a little bit more carefully about what is essential to carry for that day and what's essential for you you know with a little bit of room to spare just for those emergency bits you know so um again it just comes down to that planning and thinking carefully about what you're taking for that day rather than thinking oh, i'll take everything just in case and you carry three kilograms of water for, for no reason, you know. So just something to think about. So thinking about just kind of like, you know, what we carry then for navigating, you know, because we're going out for a day in the hills. We need to think about how to navigate our way around the mountains. And we have loads of choices of things to use. 
And, you know, it's always been map and compass, map and compass. But if you're looking to buy a compass, whenever you go into the shops to buy one, just don't grab one straight off the shelf and kind of go straight to the counter and buy it. Just be careful whenever you do buy one, because if you look at this picture, you can see that the north needle, which is the red part of the needle, they're both pointing in two different directions. So you're like, well, which one is actually pointing to magnetic north? And this is probably due to reverse polarity or it being close to a magnet or a chunk of metal for a long period of time that has caused the needle to um, become ski with and kind of veer off to where north is. <clears throat> Other examples of things that can really influence and affect that are something that we carry with us every day and is now part of our lives. And that is a phone. And phones are basically a big magnet. So having a phone in the same pocket or very close to your compass can affect that needle. Other things that we might have to navigate with, some sort of smartwatch as well. It's like a magnet. So having it too close to a compass can upset the needle and dis, you know, disorientate it as well. So just something to bear in mind whenever you're choosing um, those navigational tools to have when you're out in the mountains, especially when it comes to compasses. Just, you know, just double check one against the other, basically, in a shop before you buy one. So just thinking about, again, this kind of idea of being prepared to navigate, you know, where are you carrying your map and compass? Where is it? Is it tucked away, neatly folded up, ready for action in a pocket somewhere? Or is it wrapped away in your bag, never to be seen? <clears throat> I think it's always worth having, the, you know, if you want to have a map and compass out in the hill with you, which is always good to have, have it wrapped up. In a dry in a in a map case folded up that's neat and tidy, easy to get at in a pocket somewhere, maybe in the top of your bag or in a, a coat pocket away from your phone. You know, because you could easily get into a day where it's really misty and you just can't see a thing, and you need to sort of spend that little bit of time in your map and compass navigating your way off the hill safely. So just think about where it is, you know, and how easily and quickly you can get access to it. So <clears throat> coming on to this, uh, this subject that I'm sure a lot of folk will have a lot of conversation and talk about is technology and navigation and being in the mountains with technology. I think we're now at this stage in our, our mountaineering journeys where we can't get away from the fact that technology is there. Maps and all these other things are so readily available and accessible on our phones or individual GPS units um, that it's hard not to use them. And I will put my hand up and admit that a lot of the time when I'm out in the mountains, I do use a combination of my phone and my watch whenever I'm navigating. But a map and compass is still always in my pocket, close by, ready for action. Um, and we have a whole range of different devices that we could choose to have. Um, and there's loads of different apps that we can have, like OS Locate, OS Maps. Um, there's loads of ones there you can get to and subscribe to and give you full access to different maps of the UK and just makes navigation that little bit more manageable and easier. But, you know, the caveat of that is that they're only as good as the battery that makes them work. And they're only as good as the device that they're built into. You know, your, your battery could lose power quite quickly. You could have been driving two hours up the road listening to Spotify or a podcast, and then you get out of the car and realize your phone has only got 50% battery left, and then you had intended to use it to navigate with in the hill all day. You're like, well, do I really want to use it? So it might be that, well, I'll just switch it off and use it as a reserve or an emergency only. So just something to think about, you know, how do you, what, what do you use for navigating with? Is it map and compass? Is it just a phone and a watch? Or do you use them together as a navigation package? So, 
you know, there's no there's no kind of right or wrong to phones. Just be careful as to how you go about using it and be mindful of what its limitations are. You know, because if you just go out the, the the hills with just a phone and you have no map, your phone breaks, you drop it, you can't see your screen, battery dies, you then are lost, you know, but maybe having a map with you and being able to interpret what that map tells you, or if it's the map on your, your phone, uh, is really going to help there. <clears throat> so moving on to kind of like the worst case scenario you're out in the hills and an accident happens or you come across a, an accident you've seen an accident and you need to think about okay we need to call the emergency services here and, and get get a rescue so <clears throat> it's kind of thinking about well who do i call how do i how do i go about calling the the emergency services now, I've shown this video of a helicopter and it might be you get lucky and you get a helicopter rescue, but bearing in mind that it's not always going to be that simple. It, weather could massively dictate that it could be people on foot coming to get you for a rescue. So just something to think about, for an example, that a rescue happens, you've called the emergency services, you need to think about then, well, it could be at least a three hour wait before they come to then get us because they've got to get themselves together, get a team ready, figure out where you are, and then think about whether or not they can drive, get a helicopter and then walk in. So all this takes time and that time feeds into you sitting in the mountains, which could be three hours. You have to think about, you know, what have you got? Who, what are you carrying to look after yourself? Which we'll move on to shortly here. but. How do you go about getting these people who volunteer their services to come to our rescue and help us? So I'm sure you know this already, but if you don't, here's just a nice and healthy reminder that it's first 999. Ask for the police and then Mountain Rescue will work through the police. And then that's the process that you go through <clears throat> to get that help that you need. And that help could be as easy as that you're misplaced and somebody at the end of the phone can help you figure out your location and talk you down off the hill and that could be it or it could be that somebody has actually become um has, has broken a leg or something and they actually need um assistance off the hill something else to think about with emergency services if you haven't already done it is text you know the word register to 999 so what this allows you to do is you simply just text the word register to 999 just like a normal text message send and i'll send back a message for you to confirm your number which will then allow you to send out an emergency text message because it could be that it could be a really windy day and it's really hard to hear over a phone call where you could send a text message or that maybe your battery is down to like five or 10% and a phone call uses a lot more energy than what a text message does. Um, so it's a really useful additional tool to have to be able to get in contact with the emergency services. So something to bear in mind, and something to think about. And I always kind of say to folk as well, never be afraid or ashamed to call Mountain Rescue. You know, they're, they're always there to help and it, like I said, it could be that it's a simple phone call to help you navigate yourself off the hill or just to make them aware of the fact that something could be leading to getting worse so they're ready and prepared. And then you just give them another call to say, actually, we're all sorted, we're fine, we're off the hill. And then they stand down. So it's always better to make them aware than them finding out through other means or not knowing. So moving on to that subject of while you're waiting for help to arrive, what are you carrying in your bag for, for yourself or for the people that you're with? So something to think about is, is a busy bag, big heavy duty plastic bag that you can buy in any shop like Cotswold, six quid, 
sits in the bottom of your bag. Great for the winter for sliding down the mountain and getting home quickly. Um, or you can have a group shelter to get out of the wind, get a bit of morale within the group back up again. If it's a bit cold, you can have your sandwiches. It just gives you a little bit of thinking time and just gets you out of the wind. A little bit more expensive, but it's an investment that could save your life. And again, just lives in the bottom of your bag. And they range from two, four, six, right up to like 12 man. So it's a huge big party tent. Um, but being members of Mount Nair in Scotland, you can go into the shops and you can get a discount on them as well. So um, yeah, worth, worth having, worth considering to have. So coming back to this photograph earlier about these three people that are pretty well blended in to the surrounding. If you look, it's quite misty, it's quite dark, it's quite wet. The rock's quite dark, as are their clothing that they're wearing. They're, they're really dark, you know, and don't stand out very well. So something to think about, you know, if you're going out into the mountains and you want to be seen, you want to be kind of, you want to stand out from the surroundings, it might be worth thinking about buying colors that are bright, you know, because something that's going to be bright is going to stand out. Mountain rescue are going to see that much easier than something blending in and harder to search for. Um, and you kind of look cooler as well, wearing kind of brighter colours, a little bit more fashionable than, than uh, mountain black. And something that um, I'm always, I have, to, I have to admit, I'm quite bad at doing, but I'm, I'm certainly trying to get better at it, is just leaving some information with someone back at home about where I'm going and where I'm parking the car, who I'm going out with, and what time I expect to be back off the hill. And a little bit of information like that that you can give to someone who might not even be another experienced hill walker. You can just say to anyone, your next door neighbor, Here's some information about what I'm doing today, where I'm going. You know, this is where the car is parked. This is the time I expect to be off the hill. And then when I'm off the hill, I will give you a call to say that I'm fine. You know, and then you can just have a little bit of detail at the bottom of that piece of paper that says, if you don't hear from me within one hour, give me a call. I might have gone to the chippy or I've completely forgotten. If, you know, two hours have passed, maybe alert to the emergency services and just make them aware that I was on the hill and I haven't called back yet. And then if three hours passed, then call the emergency services again to say, yep, I think a rescue needs to be put in place. And then you give them all that information. It's just like a bit of an insurance policy for you to know that there's someone back home looking after you. Because if you're out in the hill, you have that accident and you've dropped your phone or you've broken your phone or the battery has died and there's no way to call out to the emergency services and you haven't left that information, who's going to know where you are? Where if you can know then that you can survive for a few hours, but knowing that somebody has put in a process to call the emergency services, come find you. And I, I put my hand up and, and say that I've I've been bad in the past and not done that. So it's definitely worth doing and trying to encourage yourself to do it more. So yeah, just coming back onto that. So basically I just covered a basic overview of parts of the planning stage that you need to have and the things that you need to think about before you go out into the mountains. Um, so, uh, if you want to know more, if you want to find out about the journey that me and my wife took and um, some of the mistakes that I made along the way and hopefully some of the things that I can pass on to you that I learned that might help you in the future, maybe come and join in for the, the talk next week. But just to kind of leave you with a little bit of a thought that to have a better day in the mountains um, and just be kind of better prepared is about making consistently good decisions. And that starts in the planning that you do at home. You know, if you make lots of good decisions about the plans that you have, then hopefully that's going to lead into you having a better day in the mountains. So if you're thinking, okay, well, where do I go from here? You know, I want a little bit more knowledge or information, or I just want something different to do. Um, Mount Nair in Scotland have come up with this fantastic program, the Sofa to Summit program, which is kind of the equivalent of a couch to 5K 
for hill walkers if you're completely new to it or if you want to refresh on some knowledge that you have forgotten about or you just want something to, to do that's going to help encourage you to think differently then you can join on to the Sober the Summit program which is totally free um, and it's worth doing so it's something to think about you know, go it out. <clears throat> and if you're wanting to sort of kind of keep pushing on with skill development or learn new skills you can come and join onto one of our courses as well so being a um, being a member allows you to access these courses at a great price um, so it's definitely worth thinking about if you're interested to kind of go down that path um, and yeah just check it out you know we're, we're here to help you know everyone and anyone um, just to kind of give that strength and encouragement and empower people to, to go into the mountains by themselves and on that note I would just like to say thanks very much and I hope this evening has been useful informative entertaining and fun and if you have any questions uh, please feel free to fire them across in the chat room and I'll do my best to answer as many as I can now. Someone's asked about food for the hill I think it's one of these um, it's one of these things it's very personal choice but um, I think for for day in the hills I would always look to something have something that's like slow release carbohydrates and that could be for example something that I would take now this is very people might not like this but um hummus cheese and, and sliced apple in a wrap um i think that's really good slow raised carbohydrates and it's really nice another one might be uh peanut butter and jam in a wrap as well you might turn your nose up at that but again peanut butter is kind of high fat slow burning energy as well <clears throat> but the thing is as well i think it, food that you look forward to eating don't take food for the sake of energy take food that you know that you're going to look forward to because your body will go through dips and troughs and peaks and all sorts when you're out in a hill and sometimes you just you will look at something and turn your nose up at it and go no I don't that but if you have food that you know oh, I'm really looking forward to eating this then your body will want it and will then be able to stomach it better but I think what's more important above food is hydration. So before you go out into the mountains, it's making sure you're really hydrated before you go. You could have a cup of tea or coffee or a couple of cups of tea with your breakfast. It could be a two hour drive and you don't have anything. And then you go out into the mountains and you're kind of already dehydrated before you've even stepped foot in the mountains. So on that journey, have a bottle of water with you, have something with you to keep that hydration level supplemented and then on the mountain you're just kind of sipping little bits of water and you don't have to carry as much and that's what I would do I would drink as much as I can in the morning on the journey that I go and then take you know a liter maybe on the mountains with me because you know two liters of water is two kilos and it's weird that I don't necessarily want to carry because if I'm going to somewhere where I know there's loads of streams I can just top up but food, but back to the food, food that you look forward to eating and it's got loads of good carbs and good slow release energy. So this has a good question about is there any difference between night navigation compared to whiteout navigation whilst up high? Um, in terms of how you navigate and a process of logical thinking, it stays the same. You just slow it down and take your time. You don't want to rush navigation and end up making little mistakes or errors. You know the visibility whether it's, it's reduced whether it's white out or dark you know you're limited to what you can see so being able to take your time with it just helps to keep your navigation more on track and more accurate um some people might find that in white out conditions where there's no discernible horizon because the mist is so thick it can have like a dizzying effect almost like being at sea in a boat where you're kind of rocking back and forth and some people have mentioned feeling nauseous or sick at that idea um so it's a very personal thing as well i think that can affect people differently but in terms of night or white out your navigation in terms of step by step step by step structure just stays the same and you just slow things down to keep the accuracy high Oh, good question. Somebody's asked any comments on hill running equipment. Um, is that a different talk? 
Oh, you could talk forever about different equipment when out in the hills. I th sometimes think that for hill runners, there's this notion, there's this stigma of like, I have to go fast and light. I have to carry the lightest thing possible because I don't want to be burdened with all that weight. But whenever you're running in the mountains, for me personally, if I'm out running in the mountains, I'm kind of walking up these big steep hills to conserve my energy for running where I can and when I can on the flat or the downhill. And again, if, as a runner, I'm probably putting myself more at risk by not carrying all that stuff. If I have an accident and go over on my leg and have to sit there for a couple of hours waiting for my rescue, wearing nothing but shorts and t-shirt, and all I have in my bag is a foil blanket that's only as good for wrapping up your turkey at Christmas, where if I had a, you know, a good insulating spare, spare warm jacket, hat and gloves, and a bivy bag, then that's going to make all the difference. And that together weighs nothing. You know, so I think as a, as a hill runner, carry the kit that's going to keep you warm, it's going to save your life, it weighs nothing. You know, there's so many choices of lightweight gear that is really warm. To, to carry, you know, so I always say be bothered, <laughs> be bothered to carry the kit. Somebody's asked about drinking water filters and disinfection tablets. Again, this could depend on where you're from, you know, maybe if you're in some areas of the Lake District or Wales where it can be a little bit more sheepy, you might find that high up water can, you know, you might need to have a filter or use iodine tablets to, to disinfect the water. Uh, I think we're very lucky and fortunate in Scotland. Once you get above, you know, any inhabited place or farmland, water can be pretty drinkable and pretty clean without any filters. Um, but I think if I was to go to somewhere where it was in doubt, I would take a filter over tablets because I, I really don't like the taste of the of the tablets it gives the water. I'd rather just filter out any bacteria. I'd just like to say thanks very much for for coming along and. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoy your upcoming uh, Jubilee weekend and bank holiday. And I hope you get really nice weather for it and have a really good time. And I uh, hope to see you out in the hills sometime or maybe on a course, who knows. Um, but yeah, thanks very much for coming along and all the best, folks.